This video is sponsored by Squarespace. So when I think of engineering, I pretty much straight away jump to thoughts of Elon Musk and his intense daily routine, you know, sleeping five hours a night between his 9 a.m. of shooting cars into space and then squeezing every ounce of performance out of both the cars being designed and the people he has working for him. But here's the completely crazy thing. Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, Bill Gates, Microsoft founder. The one thing they all have in common other than being absolutely loaded is that they all come from engineering backgrounds and have risen to the very top of some of the world's biggest companies. But I guess what I really want to know is just what's it actually like to be, you know, a normal engineer at the bottom working in one of these extremely innovative companies designing the future of tech or the cars of tomorrow? And most importantly, what do you actually spend your days doing? Do you just, you know, spend all of your time working on the tiny cogs, quite literally, in the huge machine? Or do you actually get to step back and see the bigger picture, even at the start of your career? Well, and somewhat ironically here, I jumped on a train last week to go and see one of my good friends from Cambridge, a guy called David who works as an engineer for one of the world's most renowned high-end car companies to find out what it's really like. Alrighty, so how would you describe what you do mm -hmm. in a sentence? My job is to decompose the customer experience we want into engineering an engineering specification that a supplier can, can deliver. So take me through kind of what a day looks like. If you have a day is a sort of pie chart, how would you break up your day into different tasks from email and messaging, calls, I don't know, design or development or whatever? You know, how do you kind of break your day down? It's probably 10% emails. Um, there's a lot of communication that needs to be had. Uh, maybe 20% in meetings, and those meetings tend to be um, alignment, so getting the stakeholders together so they can argue and get to the grunt of an issue qu more quickly than emails could achieve. 40% um, doing actual development work. That tends to include using modeling software, so taking that customer experience modeling it and simulating that model to see, yeah, that does look right. That's what I would want the customer to experience. And then lots of other things within that tool set, trying to run tests, uh, try out different things, break it down into the functions that need to happen. So to use the cruise control example, um, on the high level, it's about slowing down or speeding up based on the car in front, but that involves perceiving the car in front uh, it involves measuring the relative velocity. Uh, it involves some logic of what you're going to do on the back of that. And then there are functions responsible for braking and accelerating. And those, all of those things are, can, will be done by a different team or a different supplier. So there'll be a supplier responsible for taking the image or the uh, presence of a car, it might be using something like radar, and working out its speed. And then there will also be team, different teams responsible for the braking system and a team responsible for the acceleration, the propulsion system. Yeah, taking that customer experience and breaking it down to the little blocks that need to happen and then managing what each of those blocks needs to do with the people who are gonna deliver it. That, as I say, is probably the main chunk. And then the rest of the time is mostly spent planning. So working out on the short term, what we're we gonna do, but actually these projects can last for, for, on my part of the project, it's months. So I need to have a good idea of when I'm gonna be finished, when I'm gonna meet certain gateways. There's a, a, a visual called the systems engineering V and you start with the customer definition, then you have the system definition, which is my job to take that customer definition and make it more detailed. Then you have the hardware and software and we outsource a lot of that to suppliers. Mm -hmm. And then as you come back up the V, it's the testing side. Now for me, I can't just test one piece of software on its own because I designed the experience. So I need, I need the braking software and the sensing software and mm -hmm. a few things. So someone else will have already kind of tested that each of those works on their own. My job is to test that together they deliver what I asked for or what I expected. I want to talk a little bit about work-life balance and money and the decision to go into engineering, I guess. So the first part of it is you're looking at this career, the starting salary, I had a quick Google on the way up here, you know, is somewhere between, or for a junior engineer, maybe not starting salary is around 30 to 35,000 pounds in mm -hmm. the UK, 60,000 US. Mm -hmm. So we're talking sort of, you know, maybe half investment banking, half software engineer, mm -hmm. and sort of certainly not consulting level salary. So mm -hmm. how do you feel 
<laughs> about that. And, you know, it's, it's obviously an important consideration. And I think there's genuine concern. I'd be interested to hear your view in engineering mm -hmm. that lots of good people are being lost mm -hmm. to these kind of service industries. Can you sort of speak to, I guess, people who are feeling like they don't want to go into engineering mm -hmm. because of uh, that? Yeah, so I guess it's worth understanding the history of a lot of these engineering companies. They were in, you know, 20 years ago, it was much closer to a manufacturing company than an engineering company. Technology wasn't what it what it is, how important it is today. It was rooted in a lot of um, slightly lower skilled jobs. Um, there was a lot more union involvement. And as a result of that, uh, that's really kind of set the foundations for a lot of the large engineering companies, certainly in the UK. What that means is that the, the work-life balance in my company is great, like I, start the day, wake up at um, seven, kind of roll out of bed, half seven. I've normally had a shower, done a workout, um, and I'm eating breakfast somewhere between eight and half eight, whilst checking my emails. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have lunch at 12. It would not be unreasonable for me to finish at half four. Yeah. Um, Just totally alien to anyone. Yeah. So yeah. I tend not to, and that, you know, yeah. there, are, there are certain time. obviously there are busy times, but I think the busy yeah. times for us are, finishing at six, not mm -hmm. at three um, in the morning. Yeah. It's almost frowned upon to still be working at five on a Friday. You're expected to work 40 hours. People work more than they're meant to, but the the expectation is that you work 40 hours. Mm -hmm. And if you work more to get the job done, you're, you're great. But there's definitely no like hustle culture expectation that you're gonna be there in the middle of the night. Yeah. The work-life balance is very good in that regard. And therefore, when we talk about those salaries, and I think those salary ranges sound rough, roughly right, the hourly rate is actually quite competitive. Mm -hmm. So if you value what you're being paid for your time, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you're being paid per like week, mm -hmm. um, then it's great. I've never uh, had to work on a weekend. Sometimes I do because I've got nothing to do and I like what I do. But there's, if I my manager caught me, I would get like, <laughs> almost told off. Like, yeah. how do not do that? Because they're yeah. almost worried that they've somehow suggested that I should. I know you run your own tutoring business on the side, so you're you're able to do that. You also yeah. kind of play sport outside, which like, I, I frankly don't have a huge amount of time to do. And the other side of it, I think, is, you know, I guess I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are, because I don't think we've ever had this conversation. You chose not to live in London, or mm. at least your job implied not living in London. Yeah. And, you know, at the time, I guess, when you were leaving uni, it probably felt some FOMO about not being in London when lots of people were moving there. Yeah. But in the same vein, you know, we're here, this is, <laughs> your house. <Yeah. laughs> and while the rest of us are spending thousands of pounds on rent every month, um, you know, you have probably a much lower cost of living. So when you factor that in alongside being able to do tutoring on the side, alongside the fact that you work far fewer hours, I, I guess, it's but how did you- balance. Yeah. yeah. When there's been big events that we've done, mm -hmm. we, we get, come in on the train and like, the only thing it stops is like the, uh, the ad hoc, Oh, do you want to go for a drink after work on a mm -hmm. Tuesday? No, Which, I can't. It's I can tell you now that ad hoc drink after work on a Tuesday, if you're working at a law firm or a bank or consultant, you don't have it anyway. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah. You know, there, there's obviously um, a social state aside and, and a, like a, people have expectations of what they want. It offers what many people would describe as a healthier work life mm -hmm. balance. Um, and I supplement it with the tutoring to, you know, give me that extra financial income that I might have felt that I was losing. Yeah, I guess my challenge to you is, isn't it the case that, you know, all of the innovation now is happening outside of these big car companies? They're really not, they've not been that bothered about electric. They're not really, they're just effectively waiting for startups where you could go and work in an exciting environment to develop sort of future-proof solutions that they're then gonna buy. So should people be looking actually to just go into a really small <laughs> firm? And is that where all the exciting stuff is happening? I think it's probably worth highlighting that most companies that get to a certain size generally have moved away from making the detailed components themselves. They are closer to assemblers than they are to manufacturers. What I mean by that is Apple will have suppliers that provide their phone casing, their screen technology, their battery technology. What the company does then, you know, it's like, oh, what does the company do? So the company has to be clear about what they want to achieve. So the supplier uh, is almost like they're, they're given a brief of what, a specification of what they're meant to deliver and they'll go out and work out the best way to do it. And they might work with startups themselves, they might be a startup, they'll trial out new technologies 
Um, but at the end of the day, their job is to meet a specification. The company has to set that specification based on, I want to go into this segment and we want it to be an electric car because that's popular in the market these days. We will then set a specification that says, please deliver us a, uh, a motor or might be a full electric propulsion system. Um, however you want to do it, that's up to you, but this is the performance we expect. And then our job as a company is to integrate that um, and then we will still manufacture it, but by manufacture, we're probably taking their, their pre-prepared part and joining it with all of the other pre-prepared parts in a factory. So there's a process of going, we want a supplier to deliver this. How much are you going to charge us? How long is it going to take? Suppliers will then fight against each, between themselves, make a, an offer of this is what we can do, this is how much it's going to cost. The rest of the job of the engineer in the big car company then is validating that the supplier is indeed giving you what you wanted. And I guess uh, what I'm trying to think is, you know, if you've just come or you're at uni or you're at school or you've just come out and you're going into a job in engineering, do you already know, I like, definitely want to be an electrical engineer or a structural engineer or even to go into the car sector, do you have to know at an early stage what pathway you want to take? Or is it something that you kind of, like for example, in law, you kind of try out different departments and you eventually end up in one? Some obvious sections of engineering, because it's so big, it's worth breaking down is you typically have some form of uh, propulsion engineering. So they're responsible for making the car move in the correct way. Another large section you'll always have in any car company today is some form of electrical engineering. The electrical side is almost everything else. The technology that's on the car, the sensors, the screens, the way that it interacts with um, the environment, whether it can send data or receive data from the internet. Another team of engineering that's slightly different is kind of more the think of it like the structural engineers, mm -hmm. the crash structure. So how does the car protect the occupants? How do you package all of those electrical components so that they fit in the bits that you don't see? Because, you know, if you pull back the ceiling and rip up the below the seats, there's so many electrical components you wouldn't believe, but they're all hidden inside the doors. Many of the car companies, and, and I'm sure it's the same with lots of large companies, they will have, because of their size, they can offer slightly more composed kind of graduate schemes. Um, and many of those will feature some form of rotation mm -hmm to recognize the fact that not only do you not know what you want to do, um, actually there might be something that you're particularly good at that the company, you know, the company doesn't know how they want to use you yet. It's mm -hmm. kind of bi-directional um, trying out. So when most people think of car companies like me, you know, your average Joe, you think of Porsche, you think of BMW, Tesla, Land Rover, and I think of these kind of big figures like Elon Musk or Henry Ford, pulling the strings and kind of like orchestrating this grand vision. But I want to know, kind of actually below the surface, what do car companies look like when they go from inception of an idea for a car all the way through to me then buying that? Like, what does that process look like? You have to have an understanding of the market that you're trying to sell to, like um, the level of premiumness. There'll be a, a hierarchy of people based on marketing and strategy. And they will have people all the way down at the ground level who are looking at competitors, looking at trends and trying to work out what could be a lucrative way to go and what should be explored. That will filter up into some kind of proposal that will then be presented. And normally it's probably one of the, the big names at the top. You know, they'll put their name on it and they'll say, I really think we should start making an SUV or I really think we should add to our hatchback lineup by making a, a longer hatchback. Um, and they'll have to believe in it and they'll have to have the data to show that it's the right thing. Then uh, it will move on to the next section, which will be design. And it will be, again, there'll be people at the ground who are using CAD and pencil and clay to try and mock up ideas. Um, those areas will have lots of different ways of trying to generate ideas, um, competitions and um, trying to iterate through different versions and compare them against each other. All brands will have an idea for common design language that they want to hit with their brand. So Volvo, for example, is really known for safety. It's like mm -hmm. one of their core parts of their design. And so they will they will make objective design decisions that lower their aesthetic appeal, but because their brand is about safety, it, it resonates more with their customers than making it look like a sports car. Like yeah. that's not their intention. What, what it comes down to, what are the constraints? You need, to, you need to have some constraints. You can't just have blue sky the whole way through the process. I guess those different companies, the design led ones, will, most of those constraints in the early stages will be driven by design. So if you know you're designing a Porsche, you'll want a particular like tailed off roof mm -hmm. and that will then impact your ability to do, I don't know, a panoramic roof or something because yeah. 
the, there's constraints in how the roof should look, but the constraints around the headlights might be really minimal, and therefore there's a, the engineering team might set more of the constraints there. They might say, well, we must meet these legal requirements around headlights, and we uh, want to add this new feature that none of our competitors have. So I think it ends up being a bit of a tug of war in certain areas, and I think there, are, there definitely is a healthy conflict between design and engineering, and I include in those things like cost and quality, like those things all comp fight against each other, and I think it just comes down to, with each company, do they have a slight bias in who they'll give the uh, the final decision to? Yeah. And last question, I think when people are looking at careers, it's important to consider, you know, where's this going to take me? Mm -hmm. A lot of people that are going into consulting is a good example. Mm -hmm are thinking, not only have I got a good career, but I've also got good exit options. I could leave yeah. this industry and go and work in virtually any business. I suppose with law and with engineering, it's a slightly more specialized technical skill. Mm. Is it common that people leave the engineering firm they are at within you know, two to five years? Is it then common that they stay within engineering? It is common that people, people will move on that similar frequency, like that two to five years, I think it's probably healthy to at least change role, mm -hmm. um, if not change company in yeah. that kind of cadence. Many engineers will stay in engineering. Typically, they go into engineering because they like that type of challenge. Mm -hmm. However, if you're if you extrapolate from the, the technical detail side, it's typically about using data to solve problems, and that is pretty applicable. Mm -hmm. So. I know when I was looking at consultancies and talking to senior consultants who who I met, I asked them, you know, I, I'm thinking about working in an engineering company. And lots of them said, if you go and get a few years in an engineering company, you're significantly more valuable to the consultancies that then work with those engineering companies. Because mm -hmm. you've been on the inside, right? You understand how mm -hmm. it works. So, and it's actually a very similar requirement for of skill between a consultant and an engineer. Mm -hmm. It's about taking data and making the right decision. Great, thank you. Thank you. So now we both know how beautiful cars are engineered, I wanna quickly tell you about how I designed my beautiful website without knowing a thing about engineering or software design. And that is using Squarespace, today's sponsor. Squarespace is the powerful and beautifully easy to use platform I use to make my own website. And I've got to say, I was so pleasantly surprised when I first started using Squarespace, just how easy it was to make a beautiful mobile responsive site using their templates. It has tons of features from email campaigns to e-commerce, so you can, like me, sell your PDF notes, embroidered cushions, house plants, or, well, just about anything. They have a very intuitive blog interface if you just want to get started writing and publishing your own content, and their website analytics are amazingly easy to use and learn from. So yeah, go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Liam Porritt to save 10% off your first purchase purchase of a website or domain. As always, please do give this video a big thumbs up and drop me a comment if you'd like, and I will speak to you again very, very soon.